This is the classical guitar that I used on my hit recording of a classical gas that was released on Warner Brothers in uh, 1968 and eventually became a hit in August of 1968. Uh, Tommy Smothers gave me this guitar in 1965 and uh, he had got it from Cordova, the maker of the guitar. And uh, Cordova was a Spanish name, but the guy that made the guitar, the maker, was Oscar Teller who was really a German guitar maker, but they seemed to think that it would sell better if it had a Spanish name. And so that's why it's called a Cordoba. I wrote Classical Gas in the summer of 1967, and I'd been playing Las Vegas with the Smothers Brothers, and we'd been there for weeks at a time. I came back from Las Vegas and sat down in front of my fireplace and started to noodle around on the guitar and decided that I would write a uh, piece for guitar to play at parties. I was writing television for Roger Miller at one point, and I used to go to parties that, and there'd be all these famous uh, guitar players there, Dwayne Eddy and uh, Sonny Curtis and Thomas Carlyle and Roger himself, and they would get in a circle and pass the guitar around, and uh, people would play something on the guitar. And I didn't really have anything except accompaniments to folk songs I sang. So I decided, okay, I'm going to write a flashy piece to play at parties. So I've been told classical gas is the most recorded guitar piece of all time. And it's the only time that a finger style classical guitar piece has become a hit. A lot of great artists have uh, recorded it. I still get recordings all the time from people that uh, send me versions of it. So I'd like to thank all of the artists who have uh, covered their own version of Classical Gas and uh, thank you, the fans who supported not only my version of it, but all of those wonderful versions that those artists have created and played on their recordings and on videos and in concert. So thanks to all of you. Now there's a few little dings on here, so the, all those scratches right there are probably from my little fingernail digging into it. And these up here, I guess, are from my thumbnail. And uh, this little thing right here, I was sitting in front of my fireplace once, and a, and a coal popped out and landed right on the face of the guitar, and I had to flick it off. But there's a, every guitar has all these little battle scars, I guess, from various things. I didn't. Uh, scratch up the back very much because they learned early not to wear weird buttons that would scratch up the, the finish. <laughs> it does have the thin neck. It's not the standard sort of thickness on the neck, but it's a thin neck, and I, I sure like that because it was a lot easier to reach around and play chords that were, you know, that took more of a stretch. I should tell you about this strap that I'm using. Uh, my folk singing buddy Baxter Taylor and I came up with this. We had a folk trio called the Wayfarers Trio and liked to play standing up, but there was no way to support the classical guitar because you usually had to put your, you know, sit down like this, like I'm sitting. We thought about putting hooks in the hole and this and that, and we were fooling around one day with a, a ribbon and the guitar was just sitting in the ribbon. We realized the ribbon was holding the guitar up, so... Later on, I developed it and had a this leather strap made. Uh, one side is smooth and the other side is rough because that sticks to the guitar better than slide around. The first one I made was made out of latigo, which is a bridal uh, leather, and I went to a bridal shop to have it made. And it used a Conway buckle. That was a fascinating buckle. You might look that one up. Depending on how big you are, you can adjust the size of it to, to fit you. So that's why all these extra holes are in there. If you want it looser or closer to you, you can do that. And uh, one of the things I really liked about it was when I was writing music, I could hang on to it and write without having to set the guitar down every time I wanted to write something. You have to learn to use it. You have to make sure this stays right there and that this doesn't get up, get up here too far. So you have to learn how to keep it in place and 
Generally, if you keep this arm on it right here, it stays in pretty good shape. And uh, you can even stand up if you want to, which, and play. That's what I liked about it. So you could play in a restaurant if you wanted to as a, as a strumming musician. All right. When I recorded classical gas, uh, the classical guitar, it was hard to hear it above the 37-piece orchestra that was playing, bass and drums and all the strings and horns. And so uh, Mike Post and I, who produced uh, the record and also the arrangement for the orchestra, decided that it would be better to add another guitar to it. And I borrowed a 12-string from Jim Yester, who was a member of the association, and he had a really great 12-string. And so I double-tracked it. So it's classical gas and 12-string. You featured the uh, classical guitar, but in a couple of places when it kind of got lost in, in the um, big sound the orchestra was making, we would bring up the 12-string to give it some body. I should say that the brass interlude, uh, sort of in the middle of the tune, was uh, written by Mike Post. And I said, you know, you, sh you should put a little signature something of your own in here. And he came up with that great uh, brass interlude in D flat. It was a big part of the hit. Classical Gas as a composition had elements that I had learned as a student at Oklahoma City University. I was a music major. Oh, you studied counterpoint and harmony and uh, uh, structures of classical pieces and whatnot. And so I sort of poured a lot of those things I had learned from um, studying music at OCU. And there's a lot of elements that I'd learned in the composition. There, there's an intro that's very classical music oriented. And uh, then it goes through different compositional techniques and different time signatures, a lot of those. And uh, one of the most interesting things was at the very end, I used a thing called Tierce de Picardy. What that was, was that a lot of classical composers, when they would write something in a minor key, they would end it on a major triad. I thought it was interesting that they thought it was better if a minor composition would end on a major chord.